Okay, so Mrs. Frisbee is inside the rosebush, met Mr. Aegis on the way in, and now she's met Justin too. Okay. And now chapter 11 in the library. The tunnel led gently downward and after the first dozen steps, they were in darkness. Mrs. Frisbee could see nothing at all. Behind her, Mr. Ages limped along. Ahead, she could hear the scuffle of Justin's footsteps. She followed the sound blindly. Then she heard his voice. Just walk straight ahead, Mrs. Frisbee. There's nothing to trip over and nothing to bump into. If you get off course, you'll feel the wall, he added. The dark part doesn't last long. Now, what did he mean by that? She thought it over for a minute or two as she walked and had just decided to ask him when, to her surprise, she saw ahead of her a faint glow. A light. But how could there be light down so far? There, we're through it, said Justin cheerfully. I know that blackout bit must be a bit annoying the first time, but it's necessary. But aren't we underground? Oh, yes. And three feet down by now, I'm guessing. Then how can it be light? I could tell you, said Justin, but if you'll wait 15 seconds, you'll actually see for yourself. In a few more steps, the tunnel, Mrs. Frisbee could now discern dimly its shape and direction, took a turn to the right, and she did see for herself. She stopped in astonishment. Ahead of her stretched a long, well-lit hallway. Its ceilings and walls were a smoothly curved arch, its floors hard and flat with soft layer of carpet down the middle. The light came from the walls where every foot or so on both sides a tiny light bulb had been recessed and the hole in which it stood, like a small window, had been covered with a square of colored glass, blue, green, or yellow. The effect was that of stained glass windows in sunlight. Justin was watching her and smiling. Do you like it? The carpet and the colored glass we don't really need. Some of the wives did that on their own, just for looks. They cut the glass, believe it or not, from old bottles. The carpet was a piece of trim they found somewhere. It's beautiful, said Mrs. Frisbee. But how? We've had electricity for four years now. Five, said Mr. Ages. Five, said Justin agreeably. The lights, they were the very small, very bright, twinkling kind we found on trees. In fact, most of our lights come from trees. Not until after Christmas, of course, about New Year's. The big light bulbs we have trouble handling. Mrs. Frisbee was familiar with electricity. Her husband, who knew all kinds of things, had once explained it to her. At night, at night she had seen the lamps shining in Mr. Fitzgibbon's house, and at Christmas time, the lights that his son strung on a pine tree outside. You mean you just took them, she asked? We were careful to take only a few from each tree, said Mr. Ages. It was like picking fruit. Justin said the ra rather dreamily. The annual light bulb harvest. We had to go quite far up the road before we had enough. Even so, it took two Christmases. Justin, said Mr. Ages, I think we'd better get, go get on. They continued along the corridor, which curved almost slightly to the right, so Mrs. Frisbee could never really tell how long it was, and which soon began to incline more steeply into the ground. Mrs. Frisbee noticed that the air, which should have been dank and damp, so deep in underground, was on the contrary, fresh and clean. And she thought she could even detect a very faint breeze blowing past her ears as she moved. In a few more minutes, the hall gently, uh, um, the hall widened abruptly into a large oval chamber. Here the lights were set in the ceiling. At the far end, Mrs. Frisbee could see the long tunnel continued and looked as if it slanted upward again, perhaps to another entrance or a back door. Was this then their destination, the main hall of the rats? But if so, where were all the other rats? I hear a little, couple of little rats here myself. The room was entirely empty, not even a stick of furniture. A storeroom, said Justin, sometimes full, now empty. Then she saw that off on one side of the chamber, there was a stairway leading down and beside it a small door. Justin led them to the door. For freight only, he said with a grin, at Mr. Ages. But considering your limp, I think we can make an exception. The stairs wouldn't be easy. Mrs. Frisbee looked at the stairway. It went down in a spiral, and each step was neatly inlaid with a rectangular piece of slate. She could not tell how far it had led, since after the first turn of the spiral, 
She could see no more, but she had a feeling it was a long way down. As Justin said, it would be hard for Mr. Ages. Justin opened the door. It led into a square room that looked like a closet. After you, he said. Mrs. Frisby went in. The others followed and the door swung shut. On the wall were two knobs, were two knobs. Justin pushed one of them and Mrs. Frisby, who had never been in an elevator before, gasped and almost fell as she felt the floor suddenly sink beneath her. Justin reached out a hand to steady her. It's all right, he said. I should have warned you. But we're falling. Not quite. We're going down, but we've got two strong cables and an electric motor holding us up. Still, Mrs. Frisby held her breath during the rest of the descent until finally the small elevator came to a gentle stop and Justin opened the door. Then she breathed again and looked out. The room before her was at least three times as big as the one that they had just left and corridors radiated from it in as many directions as petals from a daisy. Directly opposite the elevator, an open arch led into what looked like a still larger room, seemingly some kind of an assembly hall, for it had raised platform at one end. And now there were rats, rats by dozens, rats standing and talking in groups of twos, threes, fours, rats walking slowly, rats hurrying, rats carrying papers. As Mrs. Frisby stepped from the elevator, it became obvious that strangers were a rarity down here for the hubbub of a dozen conversations stopped abruptly and all heads turned to look at her. They did not look hostile, nor were they even alarmed since her two companions were familiar to them, but merely curious. Then as quickly as it had died out, the sound of talking began again as if the rats were too polite to stand and stare. But one of them, a lean rat with a scarred face, left his group and walked toward them. Justin, Mr. Ages, and I see we have a guest. He spoke graciously and with an air of quiet dignity and Mrs. Frisbee noticed two more things about him. First, the scar on his face ran across his left eye and over this eye, he wore a black patch fastened by a cord around his head. Second, he carried a satchel, rather like a handbag by a strap over his shoulders. A guest whose name you will recognize, said Justin. She is Mrs. Jonathan Frisbee. Mrs. Frisbee, this is Nicodemus. A name I recognize indeed, said the rat called Nicodemus. Mrs. Frisbee, are you perhaps aware of this? Your late husband was one of our greatest friends. You are welcome here. Thank you, said Mrs. Frisbee, but she was more puzzled than ever. In fact, I did not know that you knew my husband, but I'm glad to hear it because I've come to ask you for help. Mrs. Frisbee has a pro Mrs. Frisbee has a problem, said Mr. Ages, an urgent one. If we can help, we will, said Nicodemus. He asked Mr. Ages, can it wait until after the meeting? An hour? We were just getting ready to begin. Mr. Ages considered, an hour will make no difference, I think. Nicodemus said, Justin, show Mrs. Frisbee to the library where she can be comfortable until the meeting is over. By this time, the last of the other assembled rats had made their way into a large meeting hall where they sat fa facing the raised platform. Nicodemus followed them, pulling some papers and a small reading glass from his satchel at his side as he walked to the front of the room. Justin led Mrs. Frisbee in another direction, down a corridor to their left, and again she had the impression of a faint, cool breeze on her face. She realized that the corridor had walked, she had walked in up above was merely a long entranceway, and that the halls around her were the rats' living quarters. The one down which Justin led her was lined with doors, one of which he opened. In here, he said. The room they entered was big, square, well lit, and had a faint musty smell. It's reasonably comfortable, and if you like to read, he gestured at the walls. They were lined with shelves from floor to ceiling, and on the shelves stood Mrs. Frisbee, dredged in her memory. Books, she said. They're books. Yes, said Justin. Do you read much? Only a little, said Mrs. Frisbee. My husband taught me, and the children, she started to tell him how, laboriously scratching letters in the earth with a stick. It seemed so long ago. But Justin was leaving. Excuse me, I've got to go to the meeting. I hate meetings, but this one's important. We're finishing up the schedule for the plan. He pronounced it with a capital P. The plan? But he was out the door, closing it gently behind him. Mrs. Frisbee looked around her. 
the room, the library, Nicodemus had called it, had in addition to its shelves of books, several tables with benches beside them, and on these were stacked more books, some of them open. Books, her husband Jonathan had told her about them. He had taught her and the children to read. The children had mastered it quickly, but she herself could barely manage the simplest words. She had thought perhaps it was because she was older. He had also told her about electricity. He had known these things, and so it emerged with the rats. It had never occurred to her until now to wonder how he knew them. He had always known so many things, and she had accepted that as a matter of course, but who had taught him to read? Strangely, it also emerged that he had known the rats. Had they taught him? What had been his connection with them? She remembered his long visits with Mr. Ages, and Mr. Ages knew the rats too. She sighed. Perhaps when the meeting was over and she had a, had a chance to talk to Nicodemus and had told him about Timothy and moving day, perhaps then, when that was settled, he could explain all of this to her. She noticed at the far end of the room a section of wall where there were no bookshelves. There was instead a blackboard covered with words and numbers written in white chalk. There were pieces of chalk and an eraser in a rack at the bottom of it. The blackboard stood near the end of the longest of the table. Was the library also used as a classroom? When she looked at the blackboard and rather laboriously read what was written on it, she saw that it was not. It was rather a conference room. At the top of the board in large letters were printed the words, the plan of the rats of Nim. That's the end of chapter 11. See you next time.